Um, basically, it's what I'm talking about today, we're using a lot of examples of how we've used community indicators. So I apologise if some parts of the talk look a little disjointed, but I'll be pulling out examples from across the organisation of where we've used it. Um, but I have tried to follow a little bit of a timeline because there's quite a history of a collaboration with CIV and that's been really integral for then integrating um, CIV indicators across our organisation. So within the talk today, I'll be talking about our history of collaboration. The education um, across the organisation has been really imperative to final integration into our council plan. Um, I've actually only been working at Council since June last year, so we actually have a fairly long association at Ballarat, about, it goes back to about 2006 with CIV. And so the um, girl who was before me, Sally Bodenham, I actually have to credit her with a lot of the work that went on. And she actually had a huge amount of um, effort into our previous health and wellbeing plan from 2009 to 13. Um, we had a lot of resources put into the plan. It ended up being two colour volumes. One was our evidence document, and we broke that up into five fact sheets around the five domains, the CIV domains. Um, we'd done a, a survey, and so we had our a C, sorry, a CIV survey, and so we actually had data under each of those domains, and that informed our plan. And so that was a very high-profile plan in the institution, in our organisation, and across our community. And um, it was actually fairly well integrated at that stage. We, it wasn't integrated with a council plan, but there were actions right across council. So there was people for every unit of council had to report on that plan. Um, and also I'll go on to a little bit more um, description that Sally later went on and, and actually this is like an organisational process that helped us develop, um, that she developed a regular report on the actions in that plan. And now we've reached that stage where our health and wellbeing plan is fully integrated with our council plan. They're one and the same. Um, at this stage, after our council plan has been um, released, we're now actually putting resources into community profile, which is our data from CIV indicators. And I'll be talking a bit more about that and how we're releasing that out to the public. Our MSS, our Municipal Strategic Statement, is also up for review. And we're hoping to use our indicator work to help influence that statement as well. Um, and lastly, I'll be talking about how we're working on a Partners in Health and Wellbeing document. So our collaboration with CIV runs back to at least 2006. We've now commissioned and run two surveys through CIV. Um, most of you from Council will be familiar with the Vehicle Health Indicator Survey, and that comes out with a sample size of about 300. So we have that survey with added questions that are specific to our area and a much larger sample size. This last year it was 1,644. And as I'll show you in a minute, that gives us a far more detailed level of, of, um, of knowledge about those indicators and gives us a much more um, broad basis for discussion when we go out into the community and discuss with the community. So that uh, investment we've made, those two surveys we've paid for, is actually given us a very strong footing for using that CIV framework throughout our division, which is our People and Communities Division of Council, and now also through other divisions of Council. And I'll have a few examples of how we've used it in a few different areas um, in our community grants program and in our youth strategy. So this is just basically a table of how some information came out. One of the um, questions, questions was around perceptions of safety. And the question was asked, um, do you feel safe at home during the day, at night, walking in your local area during the day and walking in your local area at night? Um, the first three, you can see most of the percentages are in the 90s. So we have a large number of people who feel very safe at home and walking around during the day. However, if you look up in the top there, the 64.9%, so we have a much bigger drop down for the people that are not feeling safe um, in their local area, walking around at night. So it's important you've got that figure to discuss. Yes, it's a lot lower figure, but I really feel that figure, it does mask a lot more of, um, if you look into the, now we've got a bigger sample size, we can look into the differences of gender, age, income, education and disability. So looking at gender, we have a much bigger difference. The see males that were asked about it have nearly 80% of males feel safe, whereas only 50% of females are feeling safe or very safe. So that's a great 
point for discussion. We actually took this information just recently to our strategic planning day for our community safety action plan, which is about to be renewed. And so this is a fantastic thing to start discussing about perceptions of safety is a real, it's a real fear for people. And, and then we can really unpack that and maybe deal with the cohorts that are feeling most scared. Another big um, area of, um, that was interesting out of this information, this is highlighting the people who are aged over 55. They were one of the um, people that showed the greatest level of fear. And then at that community safety day, we actually this show that there's a mismatch between the perception of safety and the actual victims of crime data. For the whole of the state, only 7% of crime victims are aged over 55. So there's, you know, they have a real fear, but it may not be actually matched by reality. And maybe it's important for us to get that message out about, and then um, you know, this could be affecting um, social isolation and various other issues as well. So this is actually a, um, sorry for the level of detail, I don't expect you to read the background information in this slide, but this is actually an application form for our Community Impact Grants Program. So at Ballarat we have about $300,000 that, um, that is available on a yearly basis for community groups to, to apply for for council, for grants up to $10,000. And this um, application form was actually produced probably in around 2010, just after that previous plan had been brought out. So in the previous plan, we had a lot of work around the CIV framework, the domains, how we're working in those five domains um, around health and wellbeing. And so when people actually apply for a grant, they actually have to show which domain their project falls within. So this is actually not something that's sort of pushing CIV framework across council, it's actually pushing across the whole of that external community. So we would have probably at least, um, I think they'd be in the order of 70 or 80 grants a year, but there might be three or 400 people applying for grants. And so they're actually having to, di to discuss this type of framework as they're even putting their application in. Now, this is actually a, um, describing a process that um, Sally implemented about halfway through the last plan. Um, usually with a municipal public health plan, there's an annual review. And so I'm not sure in what other councils do, but because this, our council had our plan right across the whole of council, it was going to be a massive job to go back to each of those units and say, well, you know, what was your involvement against this action and this type of thing. So Sally actually worked with our corporate planner and what I'm showing here is a quarterly performance report from one of our units, the Community Events Unit. And so they're going to do a quarterly report against, say, council actions. And, um, and what Sally did, quite sneakily, was put in all our health and wellbeing actions in under the council actions. So what this did was, rather than the health plan being a document that maybe only the health and wellbeing planner looked at, or someone in community development looked at once every four years or for the annual review, every quarter you're forced to look at that action, report on that action, it's top of mind. It's certainly not a um, report that was put up on the shelf and then reviewed on once every four years. And if you ask Sally, she actually thought this was the key action that helped us integrate the plan for the next time round, because that meant all our officers of council had to actually look at those, those actions on a quarterly basis. And sometimes they didn't have a lot to say, but they still had to actually report on it. So it just kept it top of mind, a very living document. So basically, um, for our um, municipal public health plan, for those of you who aren't in local government, um, we have to produce an evidence document and then go and consult with the community and then before you um, uh, sort out your plan. So basically, we had our commission survey and we've um, produced a community profile, which is our evidence document. Now this highly, this is very closely aligned with the CIV framework. This is actually, as you'll see on your sheet, the data framework that CIV have. This is one of their domains, healthy, safe and inclusive communities, the headings and then the underlines are the actual indicators. We've actually followed that um, almost letter for letter in our contents. We have our the same domain headings, under each of the domains we have the um, basic headings and then say under personal health and wellbeing we'll have all the indicators. We've also added a few highlighted box, boxes where 
it doesn't closely follow indicator work, but it's work that's very relevant for our area and it just rounds out the story and it gives it a little bit more depth of um, detail. So this is very much a um, boring looking document. I was told to write in a narrative style. I wasn't allowed to put any graphs in. And um, I actually used to work in communication, so I found it really hard to do. <laughs> um, and I think it's a fabulous information that's in there, but it's not easy for everyone to get to actually draw out of that document what they want. And so um, I'll put a little uh, detail in a few minutes about how we're representing that information for a wider section of the community. So basically we had our uh, evidence document. We then started our community engagement. So we took the, um, that document and all the information in it out to the community. We were on an incredibly tight time frame. I basically, we had a, um, because we actually integrated our plan, we had to have my draft in by mid-April. So basically we had new councillors come in, they're all being inducted, and um, by about February, um, we started our community engagement. We had to be finished up by March and I had to have the plan written by mid-April. So it was a really tight um, timeline. And I was listening to the questions about community engagement before, feeling guilty because <laughs> um, we did our best, but I was very aware that we were really only able to engage with stakeholders. We really didn't have a lot of time to be engaging with the general public. And I will describe right at the end of my talk, we also had along the same time, we're in the middle of developing a 20 year plan. So for that plan, a different part of council were doing a massive thing they called the um, Ballarat Imagine, which is a community conversations. And we did actually have about six and a half thousand responses to that one. It wasn't specifically along the lines of health and wellbeing, but it was still a good opportunity for community discussion and it did bring up health and wellbeing issues um, in the, in the, um, when we um, analysed those, those responses. So basically we had, um, also in our community engagement, we did um, engage with committees of council, so our disability advisory committee, our um, intercultural advisory committee, um, we had youth workshops, we had a transport forum, um, we engage with the health and welfare sector, uh, family and children's service, people working with family and children's services, and people working with older adults. And uh, I think there was about 220 people involved in that two months of, of engagement. So then we move forward with the outcomes from the, that data document, the community profile and our engagement, and we went on and we had internal engagement throughout the council, and we produced our plan. This is just the front page. So basically throughout the plan of um, realising it was the first time that we'd actually joined the health and wellbeing in the council plan, I found it really important to mention health and wellbeing everywhere, <laughs> all through the introduction and at the start of every, we have four themes in our plan, so at the start of every theme, throughout that theme, I didn't want it to be just mentioned once and say yes, it's integrated you know, and have a couple of asterisks to show where it connects. I wanted it to be completely throughout the plan to show that it was, um, you know, a properly integrated document. Sorry, that slide doesn't actually say a lot, but it just basically shows how it was the first time we, we had this plan and that those priorities are considered across all planning for all projects and services. So we started off um, the introduction of our document with our health and wellbeing commitment. And we um, talked about how we'd identified through the evidence and through engagement, we've identified 15 health and wellbeing priorities. And um, I've had to use a snipping tool to get lots of things here, so I don't expect you to read a lot of the background again. But this just shows we had a list of the 15. I've only got 12 there because I had to take the side off. And we just ident we showed how we agreed upon the strategies, how we came up with um, those priorities, how we agreed upon the strategies. And throughout it, we described the use of the CIV framework um, within the community profile to, as, um, for the evidence behind um, how we've come up with those strategies. So then we've actually, um, again, taken directly from the CIV framework, we've produced a, um, a table to show the five domains under which that where our health and wellbeing outcomes are listed. So they're the CIV, five domains. And within each of the domains, we have a little icon next to our health and wellbeing outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. So there's about 21 health and wellbeing outcomes 
and you'll see those little pictured icons will be scattered throughout the actual document against each of the strategies. So as I said, we had four themes and um, within the actual plan, three of those, we have three divisions in our council and so three of those fairly closely align with those themes and the fourth one is an organisational management type. Um, so for each of the themes, we had our vision, our, our strategic goal, and then again, another our commitment to health and wellbeing. So I brought it up again. Don't forget, we're doing this for health and wellbeing. Um, then we move through to our strategic objectives. And you'll see each of these ones just starts in blue is written in a way that, say, this growth and development section's our... Um, our infrastructure and our uh, engineering and urban planning. I've got a lot of language in there that they wouldn't usually think when they're sort of building another bridge or whatever, they're thinking in terms of, did we finish that project on time? Did we deliver? They're not really thinking, you know, once we delivered, what sort of impact has that had on our community? So we're sort of forcing them to think in those ways by having an objective, say, increasing physical activity, social connection and access to services through urban planning and by developing Ballarat's built environment. So it really is making those managers, the executive, all think in this health and wellbeing way because they're having to report, this is their council plan, they're going to have to report on this every quarter. So after our objectives, we move through to our strategies and actions. And again, I've repeated those five colour-coded domains at the top so you can, um, you know, don't have to keep harking back to that, um, that table that I showed you before. And we've got a list of the icons that will be covered within this theme. So there's three from the healthy, safe and inclusive communities within this growth and development theme and five from the sustainable built and natural environment. And you can see then down in the strategies, um, for each strategy we have a health and wellbeing outcome that we'd like um, to, um, that this strategy we expect will have an effect on that health and wellbeing outcome. And one of our other themes is called Destination and Economy. So this, this um, theme covers things like um, arts and culture, but also economic development, um, skills and um, tourism and those sorts of things. And you can see it actually has health and wellbeing outcomes across all of the five domains, CIV domains. So for us, the use of the CIV indicators, well, for me, it was very key to being able to evaluate this plan. Evaluation is one of those things that people say, oh, oh <laughs> what am I going to do? And it really, to me, it made it easy. We've started with these indicators. We've got our evidence. The plan, the actual plan follows that same framework and at the end, we measure our indicators again. However, this is a council plan, a four-year plan, so we needed a variety of indicators, not just more long term, we needed, we needed the process impact outcome evaluation. We need those short term, medium term, long term indicators as well. And basically answering these questions, have we done what we said we'd do? Are we having that influence that we expected? Have we achieved, achieved the change that we sought? And what worked well and what needs improvement? Um, the third theme was people and community. So I'll just go through a little bit of the evaluation and how we're doing it. This is our, our strategic goal for people and communities. So highlighted in red and underlined some of those key terms, taking out the word safe, well-serviced, equal access, connected communities, active participation, um, offering diversible um, sporting opportunities, those sorts of things, encourage healthy lifestyles. So when we actually come to our page where we talk about our indicators, we pulled out in the measures there, you pulled out um, that safe, safety, accessibility, participation, all those keywords from that goal are repeated in our measures. And then our indicators, the ones in yellow, are the more long-term ones that we'll have from CIV. We also have a series of the short-term process indicators, impact indicators, um, where we're thinking about how many people attended. Um, we've, we've got a few new um, service delivery type systems in our hack services, so they're going to try and, and measure. We've actually trying to increase a lot of our, um, our, um, sorry, I want to be put off by the time, man. <laughs> trying to increase our, um, um, the internal measurements that we're making, some of our new programs, so this hack service delivery is around an active service model. 
So basically that was fairly new for council and we're trying to increase some new evaluation around that model, so including that in this plan. This is actually just uh, moving away from the council plan. Since that's been um, um, finished in June, a uh, youth um, strategy is starting to be, it hasn't quite been released yet, so this is still a draft. But you can see they've picked up our icons. They've, they've made these links from their youth strategy to our plan. And they've used the icons, the numbers uh, relating to our actions, action numbers. Um, this is actually a, quite a detailed strategy and I think the one they will release will be a much more pared down but for the one that they use as an internal working document they're showing an obvious link to their council plan. So moving away from the council plan now, um, I've, since we've done the, um, the work around the community profile and people sort of see me as the statistics guru of Ballarat, um, I've been asked to call upon and, and deliver at various other strategic planning days to basically set up the picture before they start their discussions. And I've really found, um, I keep turning to community safety because we just dealt, had a big discussion just, um, last week around community safety. And basically, we, we could have just gone to that session and talked about crime rates, perceptions of safety. And they're all fairly damning in the Ballarat area. And it would have been a fairly, you know, oh. And we had a lot of people there from the Department of Police, to corrections um, and, and those sorts of areas. And, you know, and they would be getting defensive and all this sort of thing. So we really needed to broaden that story, we really needed to make a far more holistic picture of these indicators work. So prior to bringing up the crime, crime rates, we also talked about all the other pressures, the social determinants of health, those other pressures that are, full, that are definitely having an impact on the crime rates. We have very low rental vacancy rates and a mismatch of housing. Education, low retention rate for years 10 to 12, high unemployment, very high losses on gaming machines. We have a big migration in from other shires and that migration that's coming in, there are low income. So we're really setting up that picture. We have an overall distribution of household income is skewed towards low income earners. So we set up that picture and then we start discussing about the crime rates, the perception of safety and, and how we might um, start tackling it. And it certainly makes for a much broader and deeper level of discussion amongst the group. So back to my community profile, which I said to you was um, not very visually appealing. Um, we've actually decided um, to put a lot more effort into making that document a lot more accessible. So I've, I've decided to make a series of 15 fact sheets and we're not actually going to print these. They're just going to be delivered. Um, I actually decided internally across the organisation was one of my main areas I wanted to re-deliver this information. Um, but also externally, I'll be sending it out to community health and our PCPs and they're welcome to send it out to their networks. But basically what we're going to do is an e-card so we've got a one, I'll just briefly show one here. We've just got to have a one pager and the top heading will be our e-card. So we'll just pull that out and we'll email that off to people and it'll look interesting and they'll think, oh, what's here? And they'll open the PDF and then hopefully, so it's just, that, that one's a two pager, but all the others are just one simple, one single page. And so that's our, our e-card for our um, personal health one. And in some of them, wherever possible, I've actually made, put a really big positive slant on the information. Wherever possible, where we had a good indicator, and we do love eating together, <laughs> we eat together as a family more regularly than other people. And there weren't a lot of good positives I could bring out from Ballarat, because we're also <laughs> quite obese and we don't exercise very much. But we do love eating together. And it draws people in. I think a positive message draws people in and they actually are more inclined to then go on and read a bit more. We had another one about connections. We connect really well. Great picture. And this is actually the bottom half below the picture for our gambling one. There were some of them that um, I really couldn't find any positives about. Um, but you can see I've pulled out indicator data. This was an indicator um, fact that we'd actually had an extra question on our local survey about whether local people believed um, gambling does more harm than good. And yes, they do. <laughs> so basically, um, we're winding up towards the end now, but the CIV indicators work. 
Um, it's now, so it started off in our division, but it's now spreading out across other divisions. As I mentioned before, we've got a 20-year plan happening called the Ballarat Strategy. And prior to that plan, we had a big um, engagement called Ballarat Imagine. So that was like a, we had postcards, we had things printed on footpaths, we had a lot of supermarket chats and, and going out to, um, to community events and um, all that sort of thing. So that's, I did get it, and that big online one as well. Um, so they did get about 6,500 um, responses for that. Um, and leading up to that, the community indicators were actually used in all the lead-up documents. And, and they were a bit, used a bit like these ones, like little snapshots, little snapshots getting people interested in information and ready for discussion. Um, our Municipal street Strategic Statement is way overdue for review and we're hoping to have lots of input there. <laughs> um, as strategic plans come up for review, we actually, in our um, People and Communities Division, we've got about, I think it's nearly 15 plans that are ready for review in this next year. So we're actually um, thinking of streamlining this whole planning process and having um, CIV work and various things out of my community profile as a general introduction to all of those plans. It's going to cut down the work for all the individual people that used to go and have to go up and find data. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about partners in health and wellbeing. For those of you who don't do municipal public health plans, we actually have to um, describe within the plan how council will partner with the Department of Health and other health providers to achieve the desired outcomes. And as I mentioned in our tight time frame, I really didn't have time to do that justice, I felt, so I actually wrote that in as an action in my plan. And I'll be working on that in the next few months. Um, basically what we're going to do with that plan is focus on those 15 health and wellbeing priorities which are outlined in the plan and informed by the indicator work. And basically, I'll just, it might be easy to show it pictorially, um, it's not going to be, I should stop using the word plan, I'm not going to have actions probably coming out of it, but really I just want to show under each of our, this one is actually two of our um, priorities, which is obesity and oral health, and I'm just going to show basically what we're doing in the space and what everyone else around us is doing in the space, do we actually overlap? It's a bit more like a gap analysis. Are we actually working with each other effectively to achieve outcomes? And where could we work a lot more effectively? And my manager was saying the other day, we thought we might actually beef it up a lot more and get people to, to um, commit to um, some of the actions that we're going to be having. So hopefully we'll finish that off in the next few months. Thank you very much. <laughs>